Okay, welcome everybody to uh, the third in our series of conversations in political ecology run out of the Lancaster Environment Center at Lancaster University. Uh, this session is called Political Ecologies of the Post-Secular, Living with Ghosts and a Stratovolcano. So I've got two guests with me. I'm Nigel Clark. I'm the a professor of human geography, but I'm also very interested in a whole range of non-human or more than human things and entities and forces. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, I have two guests with me, Adam Babette, uh, who's joining us from Sydney, uh, Mira Ashri Ningyash. Did I say that almost right, Mira? Yes. Joining us from Jogjakarta in Java, Indonesia. Um, and welcome to everyone else who's from, from across the planet and in different time zones. So I'll uh, just introduce the session. Then I'll say a little bit more about Mira and about Adam. We'll have a conversation, a bit of a chat for about 40 minutes. At the end, there'll be time for about, hopefully about 20 minutes of questions. If you could post your questions into the Q&A box, that would make life uh, a lot easier. So just put your questions into Q&A when you have them ready and we'll, we'll visit those hopefully in the last 20 minutes. Okay, so as, as a lot of you will know, one of the, the themes of political ecology is taking seriously, not just what other people, other parts of the planet are doing, but, but all the other things, the more than humans that they work with, and live with, uh, taking seriously other kinds of agency, whether it's plants, animals, landforms, volcanoes uh, that'll be featuring in this session. And one of the things we've been talking about too is how we work from within academia, from within universities, how we work and collaborate and participate with, with other people. Um, so one of the things we're doing is really talking about between the academy, and people who are working outside of the academy in various ways. Um, so in, in both Adam and Mira's case, they're, they're, they're both are very versatile. They, you know, Mira's a, a researcher and a curator. Um, Adam also, uh, I'll, I'll mention, he, he does some uh, you know, curating activist work as well. One of the things that, that happens when we start to engage with other people in other parts of the world. It's not just their plants, animals, landforms that come along. There's also other figures, entities that are often closely related to those other non-human things. So think about our ancestors, for example, think about ghosts or spirits or deities. Um, it's an interesting moment, I think, for a lot of us in universities. Western universities, of course, have been very, very secular for, for many centuries. And even those of us who like to see ourselves as being progressive and radical, we've often been at the kind of the cutting edge of being secular. It's a really interesting moment associated with a lot of issues around decolonization that other kinds of entities are coming into our world when we converse with people in other parts of the planet. So there's going to be some ghosts and spirits and some ancestors, particularly in association with the, the volcano Merapi that's really at the center of Mira and Adam's work. Uh, Mira and Adam haven't been collaborating yet. They've got a really interesting project they're just kind of starting on, which we'll hopefully get to at the end of the session, just, just briefly. But uh, you know, both of their work revolves around this, this volcano in Indonesia. Um, a very dangerous volcano, but also a, a much revered and, and much loved volcano. So just uh, introducing Adam, who, who will talk first. Um, Adam's currently a postdoc fellow in the New Earth Histories Research Program at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He co-edited a book with Amy Donovan called Political Geology. And he's just putting the final touches on his own book, uh, at Earth's Edge, Political Geology in Java. Still that same title, Adam? Right. Um, I'm lucky enough to have had a kind of a sneak early preview and I really do recommend 
uh, that, that book. And one of the things that Adam does, conversing between Western geological science and other ways of knowing, traditional uh, Javanese ways of knowing. He's also um, a co-founder of a research activist space, the Lithic Garden, which is actually on the, the slopes of Mount Merapi. Mira is an independent curator and writer. She's the co-founder of LIR Space, an art space in, in Jogjakarta. Her work, her exhibitions revolve around kind of multidisciplinary collaborations, particularly around the intergenerational transmission of knowledge. Um, she brings together both local, national artists and international artists as well, doing a lot of uh, site-specific work, particularly around the, the volcano. Um, big project since 2017, uh, 900 MDPL in her hometown of Kalurang. Um, this, this has not only been, been set sited locally, it's also traveled, it's also traveled to New York. The, the New York version was called Transient Museums of a Thousand Conversations, which is, is a, a title I love. And Mira's work, again, revolving around um, memory, history, and, and transmission of knowledge. So if we can start, I'll, I'll start with, with talking to you about Adam first. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about the, the background, how you came to be working around Merapi. I mean, just, just tell us a little bit about this uh, conversation exchange between traditional Javanese ways of knowing and Western geological science. So over to you, Adam. Thank you, Nigel. Hi, Mira. Um, yeah, so um, the, the work that I'm doing now on Merapi started uh, a number of years ago, actually in Jakarta, where I was looking at urban flooding. Um, and I was, I was really interested in uh, trying to understand what the politics of climate change were in Jakarta. Um, particularly around um, how, how it is that such a massive urban system as Jakarta, a, a city of 20 million people, give or take, uh, could manage uh, such an unpredictable future as uh, uh, a rising sea. And the condition in Jakarta, uh, as you might know, is um, that it's on the Bay of Batavia and the city itself is sinking. And this leads to flooding, which is only going to be exacerbated with uh, sea level rise. Um, so I was spending time in Jakarta doing uh, field work there. And by chance, I ended up going to central Java where I learned about Merapi for the first time and came to understand that it's a volcano with one to two million people living on it, um, depending on how you count the number of people. And it's uh, basically permanently active and occasionally very explosive. And it struck me immediately that um, Merapi was this very unique condition that could teach me, and I think a lot of us, about what it means to live with unpredictable nature. And we know that that is the kind of condition of the planet right now due to climate change, that what we're having to do is learn to live with natural systems that we, we really can't predict. So Merapi was a kind of intensified version of that and it wasn't at all new, but there was hundreds and in fact, thousands of years of history of inhabiting the slopes of this volcano. So I came to understand that actually in certain ways, Merapi is kind of the condition that we're, we're all gonna be living in. So I spent a couple of years 
living on Merapi, um, mainly between the scientific observatory at the base of the volcano in the town of Jogjakarta, uh, which is where Mira is, and then up um, as far as one can live towards the crater in a small village called Kuningar. And what was really beneficial in circulating between these two seemingly different sites was that in the scientific observatory, there was this kind of practice that was very recognizable to me um, in terms of volcano science. Uh, it's a fully kitted out, very sophisticated um, scientific volcano observatory. And then in Kuningar on the, on the slopes, um, I was encountering all sorts of stories about spirits and deities that live inside the volcano and on the flanks that when people die, their spirits go into the volcano. There are sacred trees that have links to very deep genealogies of local powerful um, people, uh, as well as uh, spirit possession dances where um, people are being possessed by spirits that are actually coming from the volcano and speaking through people. So, Initially, there's this sense of like, oh, these are like two different two different cultures that I'm that I'm encountering here, um, and 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 I would also occasionally come across scientists who were really dismissive um, of my villager friends and their 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 practices, but the advantage of constantly going back and forth between the observatory and the village is that the initial um, impressions of differences that I had began to melt away um, as especially I was hanging out with scientists more and more and I was watching them read seismographs for instance as if they are these kind of communiques or messages sent from the inside of the volcano and I came to see that uh, many of my assumptions, and I think other people share these assumptions about the difference between traditional culture and modern science, didn't actually stand up very well. Uh, practices that are in the village called mystical, in forms of mystical Islam, such as spirit possession, such as uh, having ancestral deities living on the flanks. Um, I came to see actually had all sorts of resonances with the way that scientists work. So the kind of hard distinctions between modern science and Javanese mysticism really kind of broke down for me. And that led to uh, really sort of where my project is at now and what I'm finishing up with the book, which is a much deeper investigation into the histories of collaborations and exchanges but also tensions between modern geology, modern volcanology, modern geophysics, and specifically Javanese mysticism. And the big argument that I'm that I'm making in this in this book is that our very conception of the modern Earth, specifically the theory of plate tectonics, has very crucial origins in engagements between Western volcanologists and geologists and Javanese mystics. So what began with a question of trying to understand climate change has now ended up in understanding that Javanese mystical Islam has actually shaped our very Western understanding of what the earth itself is. Okay, great, thanks. That's probably enough to keep us going for, for several days, just, just from that, Adam, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have time to come back to some of the, the points you've made, I think are kind of super valuable for us and for the different different audiences that we have listening to, to this session. Uh, Mira, if I, could, if I could cross over to you, 
feel free to engage back and talk to anything that, that Adam mentioned, but it would also be great to just hear a little bit more about your practice and the work you do. I'm really interested in some of the, the, the temporal moves. You've talked about anticipation of grief um, earlier in our conversation, that looking forward, but also the work you do looking back around memory, about trying to keep memories alive, both, both memories of the colonial period, but also memories around, uh, around Merapi and its, you know, its very eventful past. So if you could say a bit more about the, the projects that you've been working on, particularly the, the, the intergenerational issues and, and also those other figures that, that are, are so present in, in the work you do. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for the time. Um, so um, let, me, let me start telling you about my practice by telling you a story of a chestnut tree. So there was once a chestnut tree um, just behind our village. So we always say it's behind our village because this, uh, there is a hill uh, that is located on the um, northern side of the village and it's closer to the volcano of uh, Mount Merapi and by local um, belief or uh, houses around this area should not face the volcano. So we always say that north is the behind of our village. So just behind our village there is this um, hill called Plawangan, which is a little bit older than the volcano itself. Um, it was conceived in the young um, Rapi era, something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I need to check. Um, so this tree is much beloved because uh, every now and then the grass forager will collect the chestnut and then uh, go around to different houses to sell the chestnut or just actually trade it with rice. And my uh, family, my mother, my uncle, they have fond memories about this um, chestnut that is roasted every now and then, like a special treat, like very special treat. And if um, you could show the first picture, Muna, that would be great. Um, so in 1994, uh, there was this, um, big eruption. So as you can see, the hill that I mentioned is just uh, that one on the right side behind our home. And in that hill, uh, somehow this uh, chestnut tree got swept away by the pyroclastic flow. And then uh, ever since, uh, since 1994, the grass forager cannot find the chestnut anymore. So years later, uh, my mother and my uncle was like um, walking down the street in other side of the world. And then somehow they found someone selling roasted chestnut tree by the street. And then they tell me this story. And the story of the chestnut tree is haunting me ever since. So it's like the ghost of the chestnut tree haunted me. And then the weight of it, it's almost like coming from a storybook. And then uh, living with the volcano, I realized that we are facing a constant anticipation of grief, that it is lingering and sometimes we forget about it, but it's very much present. In, 90, in 2010, the huge uh, Merapi eruption swept away 13 villages, village near uh, Kaliurang. So almost completely everything was gone in those 13 villages, um, but we are spared. Kaliurang is located uh, seven kilometers away from the volcano, and at that time we are safe. But at that moment, I feel the huge urge to um, somehow um, collect or like archive the memory of the space in anticipation if for example, the village elders passing and then the memories of the people um, gone and then the place itself is gone. Uh, at that time, I didn't know what to do. 
until years later in 2017, um, right after I went back from a curatorial school uh, in the Netherlands, I uh, feel like the only way in my capabilities to uh, archive the space is by creating um, an, an exhibition. So I create a Biennale, a site-specific Biennale of the in this area in Kaliurang, where I invite uh, artists, local artists, international artists to go for a research residency for three months, uh, two weeks, it really depends on them. But then from there, they create such specific projects uh, on different sites. So it's like, once again, I um, try to collect the story of the people and then uh, weave them together in different sites uh, that people can enjoy by walking around the site itself. So it's like, it's a very uh, embodied experience to at that uh, point. So the first edition in 2017 was about the, uh, we call it the family picture of the, uh, family picture of the, Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, the family picture of the um, village. And then the uh, second edition uh, is called A Ghost of a Thousand Conversation. So in that edition, we are trying to pinpoint this small village in the bigger history uh, of political and historical uphill in uh, Indonesia. Um, and for that, uh, edition, we try to um, create the exhibition in historical sites so people can actually learn from different timeline of the history of colonialism from the Japanese, the Dutch, the um, or, or not colonialism, or like, for example, the communism and stuff like that. So after the second edition, we feel like um, there is still something we need something more to preserve the um this memory even longer after the exhibition is finished because the exhibition usually only lasts for around two weeks up to a month most um so we try to create something longer more long live so we create, um, and but at that time we were thinking if we create a form of a museum, museum is too permanent. A museum is like um, so fixed, you know, like so fixed, but it's impossible because nothing is permanent on a moving ground and we are living in a moving ground. So at that time we were thinking, uh, then we were supposed to create a transient museum, a museum that can be moved everywhere uh, and then exhibited everywhere that people can, we can tell the story of the site and the art, present the archive of the space everywhere else. So far we have um, created this uh, museum in Kaliurang and in uh, New York last year, right before the COVID hits. And then now the collection of the museum is in a box somewhere in Seattle, waiting to be shipped somewhere else that we don't know yet because it's quite complicated with this um, COVID situation. So it's actually uh, this idea of trying to preserve the memory of the site itself. And the upcoming third edition, which is supposed to be done this year, will be about learning on how people in the past um, preserve the ecological um, situation, eco ecological um, sustainability through um, stories, mythology, and then um, local wisdom and things like that, that people believe that everything um, is related to a higher being. And then that we are living, that we are co-living with uh, different types of spirits. And it's something that can be quite sensitive because now it can be 
perceived as um, a blasphemy for um, the Islam or stuff like that, because it's like spiritualism or things like that. But it's actually not, because I believe that this uh, belief on having um, kingdom inside the volcano, for example, is actually probably how people in the past is um, understanding logic or science. And that's how it's very resonate with me. Uh, the idea of Adams having the um, scientists, the Western scientists came previously to learn about this um, through, you know, through the local belief or like local wisdom. And yeah, I think that's about the 900 MGPL and how I came to the so. Great, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Mira, and and thanks to Adam. And I love the way that you were both really kind of blurring that distinction between Western science and your know, other knowledge formations, Javanese knowledge formations, Javanese wisdom. Really starting to to do that that blurring. And I like the idea of a, nothing is permanent on a moving ground. That point that that. That Adam made that that's a problem for all of us, not just a problem for people living on the, the flanks of a, a volcano. Just a little bit more briefly, it'd be great to, to come back to you, Adam. Um, I'm kind of interested in the, the sort of reception of your work. Um, you've talked a bit about, about the role of you know spirits, deities as, as kind of mediums. So just the way that, that your work has been received. I'm also interested in the, the theme that comes up in your work that, that sometimes you know, modern technologies like mobile phones also do the work of kind of mediation and reception. Can I just kind of bounce, bounce that one off you? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll start with the, I'll start with the mediums. Um, and I guess this links back to the to the seismogram uh, and seismographs, uh, which are instruments that I that I really adore. Uh, I think they're really amazing in terms of like making a volcano draw a picture of itself. It's really an incredible thing. Um, but the the way that I came to realize just how modern technologies were wrapped up uh, in uh, much older ideas about spirits and deities was I went on a, uh, a kind of pilgrimage one evening with this group of mainly young people, uh, many of them who were kind of disaffected by current forms of Islam in Indonesia. Um, and they were turning to this kind of, which I would describe as a kind of ethno-nationalist um, cosmology called Kujawin. I don't know what Miro would think about this, but um, it's really um, rooted in this idea of a kind of essentialized Javanese-ness. Uh, and it has its roots um, in mystical movements from the early 20th century uh, and really kind of um, solidified in the middle of the 20th century in the 1960s. Uh, and it continues in all sorts of different forms. Uh, but so I went on this pilgrimage um, where people were using their cell phones uh, to take photos in the forest and um, the cell phones were capturing orbs and stuff, which um, people were reading immediately as a kind of recording of a spiritual presence in the forest. And the forest that we were in was, uh, it had a grave of a very famous, uh, very old, uh, I think he's an 18th century puppet master. Um, and there's all sorts of stories related to this place. But uh, there was just no problem whatsoever in understanding that modern technologies, what they did was connected people today to these much older spiritual histories and, and spiritual geographies. Um, and that 
also for me resonates with what it is that the seismograph does, but it also resonates with uh, much uh, older histories of technologies being connected with spiritual practices. So if you think about the telephone, this happened in Indonesia, but it also happened with the um, introduction of telephones all over the place where people thought that you could speak to spirits or to dead people through telephone lines. Um, so there's often, uh, there's a long history, uh, quite wide history of the, the introduction of new technologies also being folded in with spiritual concerns of the present. What was the second question, Nigel? I forget what the second one was. Oh, the reception. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the way that I um, think about my work on Merapi is really kind of, um, I mean, I play, I play many different roles. So uh, I, I collaborate uh, with friends in Kuningar up at the top. Um, I um, am working with a friend to establish this foundation, Kubun Lithos, or Lithic Garden, which is a kind of research center into the relationship, uh, 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 kind of focused on understanding the relationship between society and the volcano. Uh, but I also um, use my position to um, distribute funds as, as much as I can. Um, I also lend my research practice to advocacy projects. Um, so I have done work uh, with collaborators on the volcano in documenting um, sand mining uh, and building cases which have been brought to the, um, the governor of central Java. Um, so there's the work that I do on the volcano with my friends on the volcano and then there's scholarly work uh, within the academy which functions according to a different kind of language and logic. Um, and I mean, one of the really strange things is that, you know, I don't um, write very fluently in Indonesian. So um, I have been working on this project uh, on this book for a number of years now, but I, you know, none of my friends are gonna be able to read it. And it's, it's really from them that I have learned everything. Um, and so that's a, a very strange, a very strange thing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Mira, um, do, do feel like I am welcome to, to bounce off anything that, that Adam's been saying, but I'm also, um, interested in your, particularly your, your work across generations, trying to get young people involved in the transmission of knowledge in, in not forgetting things. Um, and, you know, young people who belong to the, the social media generation. Could you say a little bit more about, I mean, how do they take to your stories about, you know, ancestors, ghosts, spirits? And, and how, have you, how have you tried to kind of contact, get that work going, that conversation, that memory passing between, between generations? Could you just say a little bit more about that? Mm. So... Um... It is um, from the from the two uh, previous edition of 900 MDPL. It was so much easier to work actually with the elderly people, the elder people, because each time uh, they feel the urgency to share their story. It's more like um, an attempt to not disappear, if you know what I mean. So um, this. These elder people, they the first in the first edition, they go like, oh, they, they were very excited in telling their story. So um, and then, but at that time it wasn't quite uh, specific enough. So it's more 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 general, more on the stories of the uh, of the people, the stories of families, um, more on the story of the sites, for example. But then uh, the second edition was much more. Um, focus. So in that second edition, two years after the first edition, we came back and then go around 
walking and doing the thousand conversation. That exhibition was titled 900 MGPL Ghosts of a Thousand Conversation. Um, and there's this within this thousand conversation, the people that we uh, uh, meet, they are, some of them are complaining because after two years, they uh, start losing their, you know, like their memory is not as sharp as their memory before uh, two years prior. So at that time, I understand how this attempt to collect these memories is supposed to be constantly done. It's impossible to do this while I'm, um, you know, like as they um, complain to me when I'm coming and then I'm leaving again for a number of, you know, months for projects elsewhere. And then I come back home and then uh, talk to them. And then they go like, but if you do that, then we might lose our memory already, or some people even actually already died. So it hits me, it really hits me. So we feel like we, we tried. In the first edition, we tried to work with the younger people, but then they weren't so interested in you know, talking about this. They want something more hype or something more uh, feasible or something that invites more people because uh, for 900 MDPM, for example, because it's very specifically on contemporary art. So only around 500 people come in two weeks as opposed to if they held like, um, like a big music concert that invite thousands of people in a night, for example. So it's very difficult to reach them the first in the first edition. So at the second edition, we try to invite um, celebrities more like um, figures that, that are more popular for the younger generation uh, to reach them, to reach this um, generation. Uh, it was successful, that, uh, that attempt was successful, uh, but it's not just celebrity, celebrity that we invite. We invite um, some, a famous musician, for example. There is this one famous musician that we invite and she is actually an anthropologist, a trained anthropologist. So we invite her in and specifically we ask, uh, ask her to instead of, to not just create a music event with the local young people, but also go around and create a recipe book from the previous time, but also create like a cooking show together with the younger people. So that, for example, the, uh, the story of the food that is already gone or like recipes that's already gone can be passed through to the next generation through this cooking uh, show. And because she has a lot of um, fans in this village, so a lot of people came. That was, that was really great, for example. And we have like, for example, a famous uh, illustrator coming uh, to talk about this uh, difficult history uh, of like almost hidden history that happened in uh, this village, for example. So that kind of strategy we try to do in order to, uh, you know, work with the younger generation, try to grasp their attention. And the, the second edition was successfully doing that. So on the third edition, this coming edition, they, this younger generation, they already asked us like, what are you going to do now and how can we help or something like that. So it's, it's quite um, good, I think. I think they, that one works uh, well. So we don't know. We don't know what will happen next and whether we will invite more celebrities or not. But um, I think uh, like simple, um, strategy like that would do. Mm. Great, thanks, Mira. I, I I love that that movement uh, both between the different kind, you know, the, the spirits, the ghosts, but also the the celebrities having a function as kind of mediums and in kind of conversation with the different kind of mediums that that Adam is talking about. I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but just before we pass over to the questions, I would just love to ask you both very very briefly about the, the new collaborative project. 
the sand mining, because there's there's something you know Adam has mentioned about you know what it what it means when sand maybe sand with spirits is is taken somewhere else. And you you've said something also, Mira, about what happens when artists use materials from the volcano that doesn't always work well. So I'm wondering if we could just finish without saying too much, just, just by mentioning some of those issues, because I think they're, they're really fascinating. If I could pass over to you first, Adam. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to do it really briefly. Um, it, it's, it's straightforward in some ways uh, and, and really complicated in others. Uh, so if you think, um, or, if the volcano is uh, full of ancestral spirits uh, and deities uh, and um, uh, yeah, if, if it, it's essentially the body of the volcano um, is spiritual and is connected to people around the volcano, um, it is be currently being mined uh, for sand uh, and that sand gets distributed as far away as mainland China. A lot of it goes to Jakarta, where it is built into um, housing blocks. Uh, and so there's this really fascinating, troubling question of what is it that we are to make of um, a building that is essentially built of other people's ancestors? Um, can we see in a certain way that people are haunted? Um, is it that those ancestors are sort of trapped in other people's places? Uh, and I think that it also allows us to think really creatively about cities themselves if uh, they're not just made of dead material, but in fact, they're made of the material of other people's ancestors, which then also behooves us to ask, what does it mean to inherit other people's ancestors in our built environment? And I don't think we're really equipped to answer that yet, uh, but I think it's a really challenging, uh, interesting question. Mm. Did, thanks, thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, did you want to come in on that at all, Mira, with your account of... Um, um... So I find that question from Adam was very interesting. Um, as uh, at the moment, I have uh, a book just very recently published, like literally just today. And in that book, I wrote about the genealogy of ghosts. Um, so in different types of ghosts. Um, and then when I'm thinking of this uh, sand that people, that the sand miners took, and then transported elsewhere. And then I think about these different types of ghosts. And then in these different types of ghosts, the, those who inhabit the sand, uh, it's not strong enough to be, you know, like to be carried. Because if there is a deities in the stone, for example, the deities is very much uh, site specific too. So usually even the sand miners, they cannot take it. Because when they want to take it, it the, the stone refuse, refuse in a way that it cannot be broken down, for example, it cannot be transported, they will be haunted and then asked to return the sand or return the, so it cannot be transported too far away because it's uh, very much uh, connected to the site where it is. Um, but this question is actually making me think of uh, even bigger, um, questions like, for example, if you took a mummy from its original place and then exhibit it elsewhere, will the spirit still haunt, you know, the museum, like this very clean museum? Or if you bring, like, for example, an artifact or ritualistic tools from elsewhere that is probably possessed. Uh, then you exhibit it somewhere in a very clinical museum, again, in the Western setting, then is this uh, deities or this uh, spirit stays and then just travel there and stuff like that. So it's really like, I, I don't know how to answer most of these things, but um, it's, it's really, you know, interesting to think about. Great, thanks, thanks both of you. Um, I think that, that, that those questions about both 
spirit that stays at home and spirit that goes global in some senses is, is, a, is a really interesting issue. I know that my colleague John Childs has done some work related to that. We've got some questions starting to come in uh, for, for you both. Uh, first one's come in from, from Elena saying, um, can, you, can you see the questions or shall I read them out? Um, uh, thank you, Mira, for your fascinating talk. She's interested in hearing more about the idea of anticipated grief. Can you speak mm. a little bit more about anticipated grief? Um, mm. Is it a collective anticipation of something happening? Does it feel like inevitability? Just, just talk a little bit more to, to anticipated um, grief, if you could. Well, what I meant by the anticipation of grief is that, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's because it's always in the air here. If you, if you live here, we always understand that every now and then we have to move uh, from the house uh, away um, whenever the cycle, because the cycle of eruption of Merapi is quite, um, um, how do you say that? It happens every four to six years, for example. So it's almost always sure. So they usually say that there is a promise that the um, Merapi always fulfill, which is the eruption cycle. So there's always an eruption that will bring prosperity to the people, but at the same time, there will be grief that's um, following up with that. For example, um, we always understand, uh, as people, we always understand that there will be, um, there's, there's always this slight anticipation that we don't talk about, but then uh, we know that the house where we live in, for example, can suddenly um, disappear whenever, when somehow the volcano strike, for example. Um, or for example, we might lose someone when this happened. So it's, it's really like this feeling, this anticipation of grief is really like the feeling that we got when COVID-19 strike and then you start thinking about the loved one and then you start thinking about the elder people or like people that you know that you love that has comorbid um, you know like illness and then uh, you feel this like you feel like you don't you know that they are at risk but then you don't want to say it out loud so it's really just the anticipation of it so it's really like a feeling that's deep down uh, so I think it's something like that. So uh, people here, they live with this anticipation of grief. They are ready to flee. They are ready to leave the house. They are ready to lose the belonging, but nobody say it out loud. So when um, on the second edition of the 900 MDPL, for example, when we did this um, public hearing to the people here, and then I mentioned something like uh, when they asked me, like, why would you, why are you interested in doing this? And then, um, because I remember that uh, in one of our thousand conversation with the elderly, uh, the elderly mentioned about uh, someone passing away and that some particular someone hold the, this very important um, information that nobody else has anymore. And then uh, I say to the, in that hearing that um, this is an anticipation for the second types of death, which is being forgotten. And then people are protesting because they protest because um, for them, it's too difficult and too um, painful to think about um, having them die twice because if they are forgotten. So it's it's also this, this, this tension, this unspoken thing. I, I hope you, I answer your question. Great, no thanks. That that was that was really useful. I love the the idea too of the the double death, both dying physically and being forgotten. I think what you were talking about though also really related to what Adam was saying about this being the condition for all of us. And I'm thinking too for for many scientists, natural scientists, studying organisms, studying life forms that they know may well become extinct. So I think that working in in anticipation of grief is something that a lot of us are doing at the moment. There's another question coming in, but did you want to bounce off that at all, Adam? Because it does really talk to what you were saying about the condition for all of us, you know, researchers, scientists, social scientists. We're all anticipating 
grief of, of some sort. Uh, no, no, I'm, you know, Mira's answer was great. I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in on the next question. Okay, there's another question that's come in for, for you, Mira. Um, do you think there is a way of living with uncertainty in precariousness? Could you say something about this? Uh, just, I guess this is also an interesting question for, for both of you, that you both either work or live in, in that precarious situation of, of that volcano as well. So you're part of that problem of, of really living with precariousness. Did you have anything you could add, Mira, about? It's, yeah, it's definitely, it's living with precarity, of course. Um, and, but you know, because it's um, people here, people in this village, they live here for a long time. So, uh, in facing the danger of the volcano, they have their own way, which is um, changing usually with the with the uh, with the technology, for example. But then, um, even before that, it's also um, this precariousness is always there. I, you know, like um, for example, um, even though um, for many years, the Merap Merapi hasn't been uh, erupted for like a big eruption that forced us to uh, relocate. Um, once the um, cycle level was up a few months ago, in December, I think, um, at that time, people know that there are like simple gestures in the daily life that we know uh, that, we, that makes us realize that the eruption is near, for example, uh, people start, uh, people's car start facing south, for example, ready to flee anytime. And then everyone has, uh, for example, um, now they teach us how to prepare like, um, like uh, emergency bag, for example, for anytime we have to run, then we have the emergency bag. But before that, people, uh, other, uh, like elder people, they have their uh, own uh, wait, for example, my um, like people, the elder people that I know, all their um, belongings, like the like the paper, like the like the what house ownership uh, paper, for example, it's already been stored in the uh, in the bank somewhere safe in the city, for example. So it's really like in the daily gesture. It's uh, Something that, for example, if my friend from the city come to the house and then they saw that we have this emergency bag, they would go like, oh, is it very dangerous now in Merapi? And you go like, no, we just have it handy by the door, just in case we have to run, for example. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's living with precarity, but it's been years. And then people here, it's almost like, in their, um, you know, like it's almost like a memory for their uh, body. For example, um, my neighbors, uh, the elder people, most of them would know, for example, if they go out and it's very hot, they, would, they know how to differentiate whether the heat was from the sun or was it the heat from the volcano? Because they would say if it's from the volcano, it feel itchy in their uh, skin. And I was like, really? And then um, it happens to be usually when it's very hot like that and it's from the volcano, there's like a little particle of the ash that is quite prickly in, the, in their skin and they would know, for example. Um, yeah, Adam, please. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I was thinking about, um, some some people that I know who have uh, uh, it's in a village and it's this is like a village initiative uh, and of course like different villages have different you know strategies sort of grassroots strategies for evacuations and stuff but this is one village um, on the south that um, the village head uh, sort of taxes people to create this kind of collective pot for emergency relief. And they talk about evacuation periods as like vacations. So it's like, 
we all have to go, but we don't have to work. We get to like go spend some, some time in like a refugee camp and hang out and stuff. And we have money so we can eat. It's like, it's gonna be a party, uh, which is really inspiring. Um, and, and I was also thinking about how for people who don't live on volcanoes, like just, you know, myself at the beginning, just how immediately kind of crazy it seems um, and we have a picture of volcanoes as just being these like really kind of unexpected eruptions that are massive. Uh, but I think it's, it's more useful to think of living on the volcano as like living close to like a coastline that is also quite volatile. And that once you live there for a long time, you become really sensitive to reading changes in the environment. And eruptions on Merapi, you know, especially like large eruptions, there's like months and months of lead up to the eruption where there's earthquakes and all sorts of stuff is happening. So it's not like you just suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and the mountain is exploding. Um, it's quite, it's slower than that. And uh, when you live there over generations, you become very well attuned to the minor differences in what it is that they have to say. Yeah. I think one of the things that's coming through you know, in both of what you're saying is, is that movement across scales, that, that really fine-tuned physical embodied kind of sensitivity that in a way kind of negotiates between the scale of a very small, fragile human body and the, the, the massive kind of scale of the volcano. So some really interesting moves, not just across temporalities, but also across scales. We've got a few quick comments coming in. One from, from Cleobi saying, amazing discussion, not really a question. Just wanted to say that I can really relate to the anticipation of grief coming from the Philippines with active volcanoes around and about 20 typhoons a year. There's this attitude that we employ in our lives there called Bahalana, if I can translate it to English, it's like let go and let God. So I think really just a kind of comment, but but speaking to you from the, the rest of the Pacific Ring of Fire to, to where you are. Um, and just, just quickly another another comment um, from, from Graham. Uh, is there ongoing work to harmonize government strategies or policies with these local forms of understanding? around the volcano uh, to include local people's grassroots strategies you've been talking about in an official sense? Or is there a kind of a disconnect between these two forms of governance? So just for coming to the end, any, any kind of quick thoughts on that? Might be a bit more your terrain, Adam. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, it's ongoing and it's also very old. Um, so it's been a problem since the very emergence of volcanology in Java in the 1920s, which is how is it that science relates to this thing called traditional knowledge or um, Javanese knowledge systems. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick anecdote of something that I think was a really interesting event, which was that um, the previous head of volcanology, a man named Surono, um, used to be uh, speak quite belligerently about um, Javanese mysticism. Uh, and he really kind of ha had the posture of a, a staunch modernist who said, you know, I'm a scientist, I have the instruments, I know how the volcano works. And this, these like farmers up on the volcano with all their like voodoo uh, are actually getting in the way of me doing my work. Um, and that was an expression of uh, an attitude that a lot of people had. And five years later thereabouts, um, what happens to Surono is that he actually attends um, a ritual procession that is giving offerings to deities in the volcano. And he gives an interview to the major uh, national newspaper or magazine coming out in defense of this traditional knowledge. Um, he begins to speak about volcanoes having rights. Um, and this is a highly politicized move on his part because he fears that a growing conservatism within Islam is threatening some of these older practices. 
So there's actually a, a really long and complicated history of how these two knowledges relate to each other. Great, thanks Adam. I think we have technically run out of time. I'd love to have another shot and, and ask, ask you, Mira, but I think we, we really should close down and keep, keep to our allotted one hour. I knew full well that we could go on for, for hours and hours, but thanks so much, Mira and, and Adam, for, for your talks and your conversation and your, your contributions. I'd just like to say a quick push for our new one-year MA in political ecology starts October of this year. Do follow that up, look on our website if you're interested. But thank you to all those who joined us and a huge thanks to, to Mira and Adam for a fascinating conversation that, that could go on and on, on for, for months and years. And I hope we get to speak again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.